Hi, everybody, and, and welcome to the first episode of Digital Capital Advisors Fireside Chat Series. We're excited to have you here. Uh, I'm Andrew Daniel, a senior investment banker on the team here at DCA. For those of you that don't know, Digital Capital Advisors is a global technology investment bank. We've got offices in New York, Berlin, and San Francisco. Uh, we're actually celebrating our 10-year anniversary coming up in September here. Um, we're excited for the Fireside Chat Series that will feature about hour-long conversations with really world-class founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs uh, talking about their stories, telling us about their businesses, and ultimately sharing their perspective on the markets they operate in. Uh, as our inaugural guest, I'm pretty excited to welcome the, the co-founder and chief revenue officer of NEAR. I think we're going to have an exciting uh, conversation and ultimately a very interesting show. And so, Joe Heat, welcome. Thank you, Andrew. And I uh, congratulations on the 10 years. I hope you're, you guys are able to celebrate uh, uh, not necessarily remotely, but a few people getting together in September. So, hoping we're hoping so as well. We wanted to have a, a nice party up on the 76th floor of the Empire State Building, but I think we're going to have to wait on that one, although we're a little Yeah, it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Looks like. Awesome. Well, why don't we start with Near and, and hear a little bit about the story of Near and how you've gotten to where you are. Could you maybe make an introduction to the business and then we can go from there? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do that. So, uh, so Near is a, is a data intelligence platform, but uh, you know, the, the journey really started about eight years ago. Um, the, the, the basic premise of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the, the idea of Near was always that you know, as the whole world moves towards um, increasingly the post pc uh, device ecosystem which is dominated by smartphones but uh, we're not just restricted to smartphones it's now uh, you know you have uh, tablets you have wearables the whole iot ecosystem uh, it's it's capturing tremendous amounts of uh, of user data and uh, and there are obviously the privacy and regula regulatory uh, uh, implications of that which uh, which I'm sure we're going to touch upon uh, but at the same time, it also gives an opportunity for uh, enterprises across industries. Uh, you know, think about any any industry today; it, it, they have multiple consumer touch points. They are capturing tremendous amounts of consumer data. Um, how can we build a platform that can help these large organizations that are sitting on really large volumes of data to make more sense out of it? Uh, and and also, how can we bring a different dimension to uh, understanding consumer behavior? Because historically. What the internet has done is is it has it has uh, given us tremendous uh, control and ability to quantify what's happening online. Um, you know whether you're looking at a product, you're searching for something, whether you're connecting with a friend, uh, everything is quantified. But uh, it's very difficult to replicate that in the real world. And with devices uh, that have come in and you know come to dominate our lives and be such an integral part of our, our, our daily lives in the past decade or so, give us this unique opportunity to understand what, what people are doing uh, in the real world and sort of mapping that uh, online and offline uh, journey together into getting a, a more holistic view of the consumer. So that's really what the premise was. And as you can imagine, like it is with most stuff, almost all startups, what we started and what we are doing today, there's been a fair bit of evolution that has happened. Uh, when we started the business, uh, Late 2012, early 2013, it was it was predominantly around using uh, leveraging mobility signals and, and uh, movement data, which is uh, mainly from uh, the devices, Wi-Fi access points, uh, some of the telecom uh, providers, and we use these different signals to be able to understand in a more anonymized fashion how people are moving around and how people are behaving in the real world. Uh, that gave us uh, deep insight into not just where they live where they work but and also what we call as a deviation from from their routine which is yeah. you know when you're not at home and when you're not at work what, what are the places are you going to and that actually if you think about it defines a big part of your lifestyle do you like going to the beach do you like going to uh, grab fast food more often than, uh, than some of the other people and so on right so it's a it's a very good uh, indication of not just what you think you want to do uh, but what you're actually doing, right? So, um, so it complements what you're doing online pretty well. And and so we started with that. Uh, and the other interesting thing about the company is that we started east, uh, we, you know, we started in Asia and then sort of went to Europe and then North America. It's quite the opposite of, uh, call it counterculture, quite the opposite of what a lot of tech companies do. Um, but interestingly, what that allowed allowed us to do was to focus on building the technology for all the markets, uh, because you know when you look at the international markets, be it in Europe, be it in Asia, uh, they're they're quite fragmented. They're not as big as the US, and that forces you to think and design and architect your platform in a way that 
can scale across very heterogeneous environment, uh, be it in terms of the customer expectations, be it in terms of the quality and the scale of data, be it in terms of the, the nature of partnerships that you'll have to do, the use cases that you'll have to support. Um, and that has helped us tremendously in our journey to you know, becoming a global company. So in effect, we started with movement data to understand real world behavior of consumers. We, we were aggregating data at a pretty large scale, uh, but in the past 18, 24 months, what, what happened was that, you know, as, as more and more customers were working with us and partners that are working in here, um, they started asking us more and more about, uh, you know, what else can I know about uh, about people uh, and, and, and their real world behavior. And that's when we started thinking about augmenting uh, the basic understanding of consumers, which is where they live, where they work, what places they visit with uh, things like the transaction behavior, what are the weather uh, patterns in places that they are, what kind of events are happening in places that they're visiting, uh, and you know what kind of commute pattern they have, what's the traffic flow like, and, and so on and so forth. And that really helped us uh, envision what the platform uh, can be in the next uh, you know five to 10 years. So, um, so it's been a very interesting journey in terms of the use cases also we, we one of the primary use cases for us has been um, using this data for CMOs and the marketers to be able to understand consumers, uh, their behavior, segment them in real time, and then be able to you know, uh, activate and, and target them, engage with them, and then be able to measure how effective their, uh, their investments have been. Uh, but again, we took a slightly different approach there because we, we, we knew that it was very difficult for us to build as a managed services organization across 25, 30 countries. Uh, so we took more of a software and technology-led approach. We built a software. We focused purely on a, on a recurring revenue SaaS-based model uh, where customers take a license of the software and they have the capability to, to be able to, uh, to accomplish everything on their own and they pay us a license. And that has helped us in scaling this business much faster than uh, typically a lot of the companies in the space that focus on a managed service business model. Um, and then we've experimented with a whole bunch of other use cases as well over the years, which uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about. But at a high level, that's really what Near's journey has been. We are today, uh, we are headquartered in Singapore, a Singapore-based company, but we are fairly global in that uh, our largest R&D center is in Bangalore in India. We have business offices in New York, in San Francisco, in London, uh, Singapore, obviously, and then Tokyo and uh, Sydney in Australia. And and that gives us a fairly global coverage and deep roots in pretty much uh, I mean, most part of the world. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a very helpful overview. Let me peel it back a little bit. Maybe we can go into your products and talk specifically sure. about Allspark and Carbon and give a feel for not only what those products do, but in some of the use cases where they're being left. I think that'd be yeah. illuminating for folks. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So Allspark is our flagship product. We launched it. Uh, and you know, it's it's been again an interesting journey. From so when we started the business, we were this was like eight years ago, and and the use of data, particularly this kind of data, was fairly uh, it was very very nascent in its in its uh, in its journey and adoption. And uh, and so when we started the business, we were just trying to figure out what is it the customers want, what is it, what is it the customers want to do with data. And the first two to three years from 2013 to 2015, 16 was all about getting customer feedback, trying to figure out what are the pieces that we can automate, cradle to grave, what does that customer life cycle journey look like, uh, and trying to replicate that into a product. Um, so AllSpark was our flagship product that we uh, we took out of beta and, and launched it in January 2017. Um, it's a software that allows you as a, as a CMO, as a marketer, to be able to uh, define and build bespoke audience segments or curate audience segments, as we like to call it, on the fly. And what we did was we analyzed, we looked at hundreds of uh, uh, briefs and uh, typical audience uh, rule requests that clients would have that, hey, I want to target uh, people who recently went to a, a you know, car deal, luxury car dealership in, um, in California. Or I want, to, I want to look at women who are frequently, or men who are frequently doing groceries on their way back from, from work to home. In, uh, in the state of Victoria in Australia, for example, right? And, and these, typically, the way these used to get fulfilled by most of the uh, vendors in the space was they would run a you know, database query, they'll identify which are those, those people or devices, and then they will you know, build a segment and push it to a <clears throat> platform. And that discovery process of identifying, just the first step of identifying 
what is the right audience segment and what is the right scale and what kind of budget should I allocate? What kind of investment should I make to you know engage with these, these customers? That was a pretty cumbersome process. That that would any you know take anywhere between forty eight to forty eight hours to up to five six days. Uh, then there was a second process where you want to now target these people. So you want to be able to deploy the your your marketing campaign across uh, multiple platforms that you're already working with. Let's say, for example, Google. Uh, and 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 then the third part is where you want to be able to see the investment that you made uh, and the people that you ended up uh, you know exposing your message or ad to. How many of them ended up doing something about it, uh, and how did that impact their behavior? So. Did people look at that message and say, I want to go to the store right now? Or did they say, okay, I've registered it. I'm not going to go now. I'll probably do it next week. Or they end up going to a competitor store. Right? So we are being able to close that loop in the real world in terms of you know, store walk-ins and offline fulfillment is the third part. And so when we started thinking about AllSpark, it was all about how can we automate this whole life cycle cradle to grave um, and do it in a manner that's software-led, software and data-driven. And at the same time, one of the things that we learned while building the product was that we, when we started, we were building what we would call a typical B2B product. Um, and typically B2B products are ones that require a two, three day, four day training session. Um, and uh, you know, people need to uh, go through a bit of a certification module. And then once they've done that, then they are defined as, as admin of our users. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you, if you think about B2C products, you know, think about the latest app that you would have downloaded. You don't need it tutorial for that right i mean it's just a few um nuggets of information that come which you can also skip because they're pretty obvious but they're just highlighting it anyway and you're on the go um so when we were building the product one of the things that um that we wanted to do and you know anil who's who's uh, who's the founder and he's the ceo and he's he's a great design guy when we were thinking about how do we make this the first iteration of the product was more b2b we looked at it. Uh, customers liked it, by the way, but we were not happy with it because we felt that it, this would require, there's a bit of friction uh, right in the beginning, which is you know, training and, and, and certification and all that. And while a lot of customers are used to it, we wanted to move to a slightly different experience, which was more B2C. Like how can we create an app or, a, or an experience where they just log in and they somehow intuitively know what to do? Right? And so that's when uh, this idea of having a text box came in. You know, you don't have to go look for uh, the right data sets by doing drop down or any of that, and then sort of putting everything together and trying to wait for the data to show up in in an S3 bucket. We said, hey, let's just type in the query. We we will take care of it. So if you want to look at women who've been to Whole Foods in California or or uh, students who were seen at McDonald's for breakfast in Singapore last weekend, just type. And when you type it, the, the natural language processor is going to fetch, it's going to parse, it's going to identify the relevant lexicons. It will create a, uh, an audience builder for you with default, just based on uh, the, the language that you've uh, uh, typed in. And then you can you can tweak it. So you can go from there. But it's it's pretty obvious to you uh, in terms of what is it that you want to do. And that was that that took us that set us back in terms of timeline by easily by nine to twelve months. It took us longer than we would have liked. Yeah. But that paid off significantly because. What that did was obviously from an operational standpoint, it reduced the dependence on having a very large onboarding team or a very elaborate plan and the friction. But it also just helped us, um, uh, you know, differentiate the product significantly, significantly from the crowd. Uh, when they would look at AllSpark, they would say, I have, we haven't seen anything like this before because you're used to a certain kind of experience when it comes to B2B. This is very different. Um, so that product has been in, in, in the market for four years um, it's live in 24 countries today. Um, you know, it's, it's used by uh, CMOs, by advertising agencies, marketing service providers, uh, and they use it to be able to build bespoke segments of people based on offline behavior and uh, and then deploy it on a platform of their choice. For example, if you want to be sure, you know, rolling out, if you're, if you're launching a, an electric vehicle um, and you want to look at people, not just who, who liked Tesla on social media platform or search for Tesla, um, but people who actually went to uh, a Tesla dealership uh, for a test track because that's a you know, stronger intent. And so, uh, so, and then you can identify that segment and then, you know, target them through YouTube on Google, for example. Right? So, so that's where it sits as a complementary layer of intelligence with a very robust set of tools on top of your existing platforms. And that's where the friction was reduced significantly. 
Um, so that's the first product. Uh, the second product, Carbon, is is more recent. It's just twelve months in in, in business, and and that was born out of again customers who were using AllSpark. They said this is a great product in the context of uh, identifying the relevant audience and then activating them, um, and then being able to measure the efficacy of our investments. But you know, we have a lot of decisioning to do before and after that as well. Right? So if I'm if I'm a retailer uh, or an FMCG uh, company, I uh, how do I even know that this is the right audience I want to target? Um, if if I am a bank and uh, I want to be able to you know sell a home loan product, how do I figure out who are the people who are looking for uh, one who are looking to buy a house and two who would be in the need. For uh, right. for a home loan product, right? Um, so there's a lot of decisioning that was happening pre and post, which a lot of customers said that this particular product does not solve for, and hence we would love to be able to access uh, the underlying data and the APIs to be able to get a much better understanding of consumers. And one way I I, I like to explain this is is that you know if you think about any any uh, you think about a retailer, you think about e-commerce, a bank, a media company, they have a really good understanding of what their customers do when they are when they are in their environment. So if you're an e-commerce app, you know what customers are doing on the app. Um, when you're a news site, you know what customers are doing when they're online reading news articles. The moment they leave, that's when you, you lose them. Same, same for a brick and mortar store. And that's where we come in. If we can augment your understanding of your customers with what they do when they're not in your environment, then you can use that information to really get um, a, a much better understanding as well as use it for taking far more informed decisions, uh, increasing the average revenue per customer, driving personalization, um, uh, enhancing your understanding of, of their behavior, etc. So that's really what how Carbon came into the picture. Yeah. Let, let's step back a little bit because I think Nier has followed a very interesting transition that's occurred in the business life. I think you've hinted on a little bit, which is starting around mobility, maybe location or geospatial, then moving towards transaction, moving towards identity, and ultimately building a, with two, two combinations of products, a very broad spectrum visibility towards the consumer, which, by the way, from an accessibility perspective, ease of use perspective, um, and ultimately technology sophistication perspective, has enabled you to grow very rapidly. I think a lot of that's benefited you in regards to the financial growth. And so I'd be curious curious as we kind of break those pieces apart, how you think about um, each of those, right? Location intelligence, some of the new data sets, whether it's transactional identity and ultimately where we're headed. And so maybe we can start in, in location and geospatial and how you think about the role of location and geospatial data relative to targeting efforts. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and you know, it, it's one that uh, that we, we not, a, not a day goes by when you don't think about it, obviously. Yeah, sure. um, um, location data is uh, it, it's it, it's a very interesting and first of all it's a it's a it's a still a such a new uh, space. The idea of geospatial data has been around forever, but um, the, the 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 volume and velocity of data that we've all of a sudden had access to just in the past decade, um, we obviously never had it before uh, before you know two thousand eight nine when, when the smartphone started to proliferate. Uh, so the space is still, in that sense, fairly new. And and one of the things that um, a lot of a lot of people don't realize is that even though you've had this whole uh, geospatial uh, industry for you know decades, uh, and you've, you've had these companies that have done extremely well and, and they continue to, most of those platforms are not designed to handle the the volume and velocity of data that we are seeing today. Most of those platforms were designed with the idea of having having some cartographers doing some data collection, doing some aggregation cleaning, and then being able to basically plot it on a map and then deliver some insights. Uh, but that data is not as dynamic, even near as dynamic or, or as voluminous as, as what we have today. So on, on one hand, you have these really large uh, data platforms that are mining very large volumes of data. And then on the other hand, you have these geospatial platforms that are really good at visualizing and driving insights, but they're fairly static. And uh, location and true location intelligence platforms are the ones that sort of are at the intersection of the two, in, in our view, where you're not just uh, you're not just analyzing very large volumes of data, you're applying machine learning and AI to be able to make sense of it. 
but you're also being able to you have the capability of bringing the best of the geo the traditional geospatial world to be able to uh, give a visualization layer that helps them bring that data to life that helps them derive the insights so interestingly enough when this whole world came about uh, in the past 10 years the most obvious use case has been in, in terms of either you know funding an ad based model so using the data for running ad campaigns as a as a full stack solution with with man services and there are a number of companies in the us that have been that have been doing that uh to to a relatively successful degree uh, but uh, but then there is this the other part where it's more consumer focused where how can you provide um use location to provide really valuable services to end consumers and obviously now you have this whole online offline space where uh where the, the transaction happens uh, or discovery happens online fulfillment happens offline and so on and whether it's ride sharing grocery delivery uh, food delivery social networking etc uh-huh. and uh and i think that that evolution has meant that you have you have um on the supply side you have access to really good quality and high volume of location data uh you obviously need the tools and the know how to be able to make sense of it i mean it's we first one of the things that we always used to get asked in the first 18 24 months of our journey was like why can't i just do that i'll just plug into the apps and i'll just just buy some data from the telcos and i can just build this platform and um and it was all it was quite funny to see that because you know technically yes you can do everything but um Is, is that where you really want to spend a lot of your time and energy over the next few years because it's going to take a few years to do it right uh, or do you want to just you know work with someone like us who who's been doing this for for years and uh, and are experts in this so there is a lot of tool set and investment that you need to do you need to understand not just where the person is but what that place is is you know is this an office is it a residential area is this a hospital and then you need to be able to plug in a lot of gaps because this data is still quite noisy if you're privacy compliant if you're worried about getting using data only that comes with consent from the end user you're not going to get a whole lot of data you will get some data and then you have a lot of uh, gaps and that's where data science and machine learning comes in um so so while on the supply side there's been accessibility data has been increasing obviously with the proliferation of cloud and computing costs going down uh, it's given us uh, and a lot of companies the opportunity to maximize what you can get out of it on the demand side though it's a very different story so advertising marketing as a as a business model is more conventional and i think it was it was the idea of understanding consumer behavior based on the real world signals uh, is something that was embraced fairly quickly yeah. by by marketers but when you think about some of the other use cases uh, you know be it hedge funds using it to generate alpha which i'm sure you'll be very familiar with um being able to use this for smart city development or development infrastructure planning um being able to use this for site selection where should as a retailer i open, should i open my next store Wh- whenever it came to uh someone getting access to uh, sort of refined but still data feeds rather than a full fledged workflow product software uh, and they had to really wrangle with the data and then be able to generate their own insights and be able to fill it in their their own custom stack or workflow or data lake or what have you derive the recommendations and act on it so as a retailer if i give you all this data say this is this is all the data i have about your stores about the competitor stores people who are going there their behavior um in in an ideal world you should be able to use it to decide okay this these are the five places where i should be opening my next stores um but the challenges there are significant in that one most of uh these traditional um offline first companies i was i would call them uh, don't have uh the 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 technical jobs or or the the data science teams or the data engineering infrastructure to be able to you know deal this is not data that you get in a csv and some yeah. analysts can can run take paper tables on right um and then the second challenge is even if you do have that have you dealt with this kind of data before and and how do you use this and what kind of decisions do you think you can take with this kind of data yeah and so that that category where uh, you are using this data to solve a lot of different kinds of problems i think that is still in in its infancy and and that to us is an area where we feel there are tremendous opportunities interestingly enough as unfortunate as this pandemic it is it has also uh, you know given you uh, given everyone a clear sense of what role 
mobility data can play yeah. in being able to understand in this new setting now it is a setting it's not a story anymore it was a story two months back now it's a setting into or, or a backdrop for every every story um, so in this new backdrop uh, what's the behavior of, of of your customers if you're if you're a retailer where people are coming to shop frequently or to come into groceries um, how do you know out of those 100 people who just come on a, on a regular week weekend how do you know how many of those 100 people are actually willing to come back now that the lockdown has been relaxed uh, and how many of them are not going to come they will just stay at home they're not going to take any risk so on that spectrum of risk takers risk averse and then people who some were somewhere in the in the middle and balancers uh, how, where are your customers and and probably the most compelling signal signal that you need to look at is what is their behavior you know how how are they moving around outside of the house are they leaving the house at all if they're not then as as uh, as a grocery retailer you need to think about how what messaging you want to drive to them they're not going to leave so you might as well draw, drive them to your to your e-commerce app uh, whereas if there are people who are leaving or going out and about you you can drive them to your store but then you probably want to educate them about you know social distancing sanitization and so on and so forth right so so covid has actually brought to the fore the the capability of or the value of mobility data and location data and the role it can play in uh, i just gave you an example but you know think about hotspots or or uh, how strictly quarantines are being followed in certain areas which are which are you know, the red zones if you can call it that or um, potential risks of spreading we we've, we've seen uh, a lot of instances where you know unfortunately this has happened where you have a lot of people get gathering and then there's a super spreader and then they just yeah. go all over and how do you do contact tracing right so in all of those areas uh, location data movement data can play a significant role and and what that has also done is it actually expedited or or accelerated uh, forced governments to also really think about how they can embrace technology yeah. and data much faster in making decisions which probably would have taken much longer but but now we are seeing that happen much faster Yeah. I think from the banking perspective we see it quite similarly right there's really been an evolution in geospatial and location intelligence from two separate camps I think I think you've hinted at and on one side you got start with where you ended which is on the demand side of things in the advertising world you have these companies that have been built mainly to leverage fairly commoditized location intelligence data yeah. into ultimately advertising solutions right for targeting purposes yeah. that comes in a variety of linguistic forms you hear a lot of different marketing messages around it but the reality is that it's fairly commoditized right and i think one of the things that buyers really struggle with on that side is why do i need to go own that business right if i'm going to go spend 50 million or 100 million or 200 million to go buy somebody am i better off spending that money internally and building something that's exactly what i need knowing there's a time gap there but what is the buy versus build analysis and so i think there's a lot of companies that fit in that category that have not built SaaS platforms right they built programmatic businesses yeah. really and are now getting some margin on top of what you get in the standard um, kind of DS yeah. setting because they're they're layering in some kind of targeting which is great but is that a sustainable market position and i think the second wave of development was really geospatial intelligence that's typically labeled but it's the platform players right and it's saying well yes we might pull from data exchanges right and have access to fairly commoditized data to some extent what we're doing that's different is we're deriving actionable insight on top of that data and so they're yeah. taking that location intelligence data um, from a variety of sources embedding it into a single platform and then figuring out how do we not sell this as a programmatic solution right knowing that the economics and valuation are pretty different but it's yeah. like sell it as a SaaS solution and ultimately try to build something that a user wants to go use with a lot of value laid over the data source so that it's really difficult right. for them to go sell and go build it internally and i think the evolution that's happened is emerged two separate groups of businesses where you know what one set has done much better than the other uh, i think the folks who have built platform first where ultimately somebody's paying SaaS tools to go to go in the user yep. platform are doing much better and i think what we've also seen in in covid i think has helped to accelerate this as well not only has digital adoption enhanced right this is a, a sector that the data has been around for probably 10 years or maybe 12 years when you want to trace back to the beginning of yeah. the smartphone as you hinted at but adoption from customers i think is much newer right if you look at where customers in aggregate really understand this it's relatively new when you're talking the last 5 years and so there's still a lift to happen where customers say i absolutely need these targeting capabilities and i think we're getting closer to that and i think covid helps to ultimately accelerate that adoption right and make people say you know we're trying to deal with the online right now right we're getting if we're a retailer we're getting a lot more effort spent into our e-commerce we're getting used to that data and what that feel looks like 
and maybe when we go back to our offline setting, we should figure out how to merge these two worlds, right? We've captured information, we've captured data. How do we bridge the gap here to make our offline more, more interesting? And I think at the same time, the ROI minimums, that is the level of return needed on the dollars spent, whether it's targeting, whether it's advertising, whether it's whatever, has increased, right? And I think folks have a real sensitivity towards the dollars they're spending. And I think that, again, all aids in the adoption. Can we be more informed? And I think what's more interesting is we, we haven't just stopped the kind of geospatial mobility location intelligence. There's a lot more now being built in. And some of the data sets that are being built in are exclusive. And I think that provides a lot of value to businesses. I know you got some interesting data sets that you layer in, whether it's transactional data, whether it's identity data. And so I'd be curious as you think about the, the broader picture, right? And ultimately the ability to really understand the end consumer in a very holistic way beyond just location intelligence. How do you think about that? And how do you think about that evolution? Maybe I've just into that. No, that's a, that's a that's a great point, and it's it's um, it's almost uh, surreal what has happened over the past eight to ten weeks. Um, you know, while at a, at an individual level, we've all uh, obviously been uh, faced with something that <laughs> none of us has ever uh, encountered before, and and you know, worried about safety and security and, 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 and well-being of uh, family and loved ones and colleagues etc at a macro level what is happening and, and that's something that you you know as time goes by you don't think about it every day but then a few weeks go by and you you, you come across yeah. something or you speak to someone and you realize where did this did that just happen in four weeks and so just uh, you know we think about how shopify as a company has uh, just the growth has accelerated sure. and that is directly linked to how a lot of the brick and mortar stores are forced to uh, create their digital storefronts or invest more in their in their digital storefronts i've had a number of conversations where uh, there's for example there's one very large uh, consulting uh, business and 80% of their um, uh, you know their 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 solution used to be on-prem even even till this year and their cloud solution has exploded in the yeah. past uh, eight weeks i mean that that the, the target that they said on their earnings call was was a target for 2022 they've yeah. actually over received that target in eight weeks so i think at a macro level what uh, as you rightly said digital transformation as a as a uh, you know, as a phrase has been around, it's 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 a phrase that's uh, talked about at, at so many of the leadership forums. We've heard from so many industry leaders about it, keep hearing about it. Um, and and I think for a lot of the companies, it was something that was aspiration, was part of their roadmap uh, yeah. with a certain time and distance in between. Uh, and that's uh, good or bad. That's not a luxury that they have anymore. They have to embrace and they have to and digital transformation as much as it's about in investing in um, in technology and cloud and unified customer view it's actually a change of mindset right if you decide to do something as an organization you, you can you can do sure. it and, and i think that mindset shift top down has been forced on all of us and and so so on one hand you you see these large organizations governments included that they have to you know make investments in areas that they've been talking about but but now they have to uh, put the money where the mouth is, uh, which is a great opportunity for, for technology companies like us. Uh, on the other hand, you also see these other trends where you know Google has deprecated or decided to deprecate third-party cookie and a lot of uh, announcements that Apple is making. And so you know that uh, companies will have to rethink and reimagine how they understand, identify, and understand consumers. And then obviously there's the privacy laws, which are calling everything as personal information. So you need to have a basic consent framework in place without which you just can't operate, without which you just can't index any information at an individual consumer level. So, and then obviously with, with COVID, all of this happening, I think it's 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 all coming to a point where um, there are these different um, uh, major trends that are coming together and it's, it's going to be a... a a really, really interesting uh, decade in, in front of us. Uh, in fact, I feel that a lot of the things that were going to happen in the next five to ten years, you know, have, I mean, they'll get acceleration in a matter of next six to twelve months, which is a huge opportunity. So, I think you know the point that you're mentioning around how um, 
the location data and movement data has been such an integral part of uh, understanding consumer behavior. We've been focused on that data has always been there. I think customers have been forced to embrace it a lot more now, at least seriously consider uh, investing in, in these capabilities. Um, but from our perspective, even, even pre-COVID, uh, you know, as we've been thinking about developing the platform, what we realize, and this was, again, something we've been fortunate that you listen to your customers enough, they'll tell you what, what they want and, and sort of take you in the right direction. Um, and we always knew that this is a great fundamental layer for us to build a platform on top of, but we shouldn't stop at this because uh, as as the world gets more uh, digitized and consumer experience becomes more fragmented across different uh, channels and screens, uh, you have not just the offline companies going online, you also have online companies that are investing in offline presence as a more concept or experience store or offline fulfillment, even if the discovery is online. And, and so it becomes even more important for, uh, for, for organizations to invest in one understanding of getting a more persistent identity of, of their customers. Yeah. And secondly, being able to then uh, create their own uh, data capability where they can augment and not just deal with their own first-party data, but also be able to invest in second and third-party data to get a far more holistic view of, uh, of their customers. And, and again, there's always this, this concern that a lot of industries have Again, some of the large incumbents, uh, the large players on the internet, Google and Facebook, and, and now with Amazon, where they want to invest in building a lot of these capabilities in house. That phenomenon, while it's been talked about, it has really accelerated. And, and so one of the uh, core part of our strategies has always been uh, in getting access to, as you said, differentiated, exclusive, unique data sets, which... Um, which help us bring a very different flavor to the insights that we are yeah. able to derive. So be it in terms of getting access to highly differentiated Wi-Fi or beacon data or telecom data. And these are all very different signals that act very differently. So GPS is fairly accurate. Um, and uh, it comes to the signal which allows you to target that user. Uh, the, the cell tower-based data is not necessarily as accurate in terms of just the granularity, but it's very, very persistent. So you're getting signals with high frequency so it's actually very good for charting the commute path so where the person is and where the person is going uh, and then on the other hand you have the indoor positioning systems like beacons and wi-fi hyper accurate they are you know they go down to uh, almost two feet two and a half feet uh, but they are not uh, you, you're not in a store all the time right so you're just, you're moving around and so it's not as persistent in terms of the mac address and whatnot so being able to use these different sources to be able to achieve different parts of the or deliver different parts of the insights is, is, is one one aspect and then being able to augment that with uh w- what are the areas where customers are uh spending their money so what product categories they're spending on um online as well as offline what kind of content are they consuming online so you've had differentiated unique um, value exchange partnerships with some of the largest media companies, app companies, which give us signals around uh, what kind of apps people have on the phone, uh, what kind of content they're consuming down to the you know, content category. Uh, and then being able to look at a whole bunch of other signals, which which then tend to be very enterprise specific. So, uh, for example, a lot of the customers want to be able to uh, marry our data, for example, uh, the banks want to be able to marry our data with uh, with their financial financial transaction data to be able to build uh, more robust profiles. Again, the, the the home loan product that I was talking about, where where do people live in a certain neighborhood? How many of them are looking to buy a house? Uh, are they looking to buy a house in an area where there is a significant delta in the home price of where they live versus where they're looking for a house? Primary targets for a home loan product. So that's when it becomes really, really interesting. And and you can take it in very different directions. And, and one of the areas where we've been investing significantly is being able to modularize the platform to the extent where, one, it can be easily deployed uh, for uh, in, a, in a private instance for the enterprise. And two, it can actually handle multiple disparate kind of first-party data sets on top of it. So if you have transaction data of your own, you can, you can uh, pull it in. If you have... Um, if you're a you know a company that is uh, selling insurance uh, and you work with some insurance clients and you have a certain kind of data around uh, risk profile of businesses and consumers, you can load that as well. So it really is purpose built, and that's the direction in which we are going. Where the foundation, if that is robust and solid enough and and, and battle tested, 
then you can take it to the next level where you can sort of purpose build it and and um and make it robust enough for enterprises and for their customized use case and solutions and that actually leads to long term engagement and stickiness right because it it's it's hard enough to to invest in a vendor as is but if you're doing it where it becomes an integral part of your infrastructure then then it just leads to far more stickiness yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's frankly what excites me about your business, right? And I think that's where the ultimate winner is, is that if you can become that hub, right, whatever it is, everyone afraid it up. But if you're that hub and you have all the data that folks are interested in from a variety of different sources, you're not only just aggregating, yeah. but you're cleansing it, you're selecting it, and you're doing yep. it, right? I think the hard part that's often not understood is, and maybe you can do this a little bit, you can ingest the data, right? If you're an enterprise, yeah. you can ingest the data. If they're non-exclusive data sets, but then what do you do with it, right? And you're often left yeah. with this pile of, stuff that you can't really yeah. park very well. And so yeah. that there's value in that, but then layering on top actual insights, I think you're rightly pointing out that if you're then able to say, okay, we've got a database, if you will, we've got a hub here, a tool, a harbor, and now let's pull in whatever data you have and we can line that up against yeah. what we have and really expand the visibility and do that in a SaaS setting, right? You're really easy to use. Yep. It doesn't require a whole lot of services, doesn't require a whole lot of integration effort, right? It's seamless. That's a really valuable market position to have. And I think that's where many platforms aren't at yet, right? I think a lot of folks are still struggling. And again, as I think about the future winner, I think it definitely comes from the side that's doing this as SaaS, right? It's not going to come from the side that's doing this as a pure programmatic targeting business. But I think yeah. there's still a very significant technology gap in aggregate from players that are doing it in SaaS right now and where we need to get to. I think you guys are pretty far along and certainly at the front of that evolution. And I think it's a very exciting place to be. And I think what that ends up describing, right, and we talk about this sometimes through a, a CDP language, because we talk about it through an identity yep. map, and we talk about it, whatever, but you end up with a central vehicle that ultimately you can build whatever you'd like against, right? And whether that's targeting, whether that's uh, trying to understand your consumer and doing customer help, whether that's trying to make suggestions of products, whatever, if you have that central hub in the infrastructure that exists, it doesn't necessarily matter what you label it. That's a really valuable thing to go on. Yep. Yeah, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely, you're, you're spot on. In fact, we, I have, um, I did not realize it for the longest time, but uh, when I, I, I had a number of discussions with uh, folks in, in very senior leadership positions at, at, at the more traditional companies like the brick and mortar retailers, yeah. uh, banks, and uh, obviously you'd never you know, hear about, about it in the open, but candidly, it's so often that they've admitted that um, they don't have uh, a budget is not a problem. Obviously, they have money. They have budget allocated for such projects to buy this kind of data to invest in such solutions yeah. and platforms. But they, they the, the thing that they struggle with is the big. It's I, I was I couldn't believe it when I first heard it, but then when I heard it a number of times. Realized this is true. Is that the biggest hurdle that they have is they just struggle to. Uh, acquire talent uh, to be able to build the right infrastructure to be able to um, do a lot of the uh, you know the, the buzzwords AI machine learning uh, they hear about it to be able to do any of that themselves yeah. uh, and that because they're competing with the tech companies and you know, Amazon and Facebook and Google's of the world and and that's been one of the biggest struggles and so so to your point I think the what we feel is that. In that sense, you know, what the CDPs are doing, uh, there are a few different trends, right? I mean, CDPs also come in, you know, different flavors, shapes, and sizes. Um, it's 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 a natural evolution to what uh, the, the DMPs were, and, and and it is in the right direction given that third-party cookies and, and those kind of uh, identifiers are not as persistent. Um, we believe that uh, one, yes, there is uh, there is a need for a, a, a more robust. Uh, solution in terms of having an identity graph, which we've been working on and investing in over the past uh, few years, on how do we have an identity as a concept is at different levels of abstraction, right? It's it's you know it's at a it's at a device level, it's at a uh, at an individual level in terms of the number of devices I have. It it, ha it is at a household level, it's at a home address level. Who are the people in your family? Some of the biggest industries, like television, for example, still works on household. It has no concept of individual. <laughs> the whole thing moves to OTT. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so it is at different levels of abstraction. And so, when we think about identity, we we have to take into account all those levels of abstraction because only then 
will you be able to build a solution that caters to different industries and different different players within an industry that's number one and number two i think the the the, the aspect that gets uh, uh, ignored or it's not given the the right amount of importance is that a lot of companies think about identity as 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 this this single repository and you guys have to you know ping my server yeah. and, and you have to subscribe to my my identity uh, uh, id and use it in our view i think a lot of it is going to get democratized and decentralized over the over the next 5 to 10 years tremendously decentralized and i think that's when the real value and power of uh, this this you know, consumer identity and understanding consumer behavior will really get unleashed when a lot of the control in terms of using it wrangling the data disseminating it activating against it generating insights lies with the enterprise because our experience has been that the way a bank wants to use this data versus the way a retailer wants to use this data versus the way uh, a grocery delivery com- company wants to use this data there's a world of difference it's yeah. unbelievable how different they are and not just in terms of how they want to use the data but also in in, in terms of just the, the, the their own level of sophistication a mobile first company thinks about and moves on these projects very differently from let's say a bank also given the regulatory uh, challenges with that so uh, so you're right i think this is going to be, this is a very integral part of our focus going forward because we feel that that is uh, it's not a core business but it's something that really underpins and brings all the value of the platform and the data that we collected to life yeah, 100% and again our hope is that covid-19 helps to aid in the transformation that needs to occur at some of these different use cases and i think the reality is that each company is its own battle and you have to understand the level of sophistication they have but for us we think that ultimately that identity granularity is what's really important right? i think identity is getting this yeah. word now because third party cookies disappeared although i think that was coming yeah. for a long time it wasn't surprised people in the industry but a lot of people who were in the industry were surprised by that so device id is being thrown around a lot identity is being thrown around yeah. a lot nobody really understands sometimes what it is they're saying if you speak to the operators though i think it's really about the granularity of identity and then the the thing that i think ultimately creates the winning platform is there is a near term opportunity for those that have a technological advantage right now to be embedded in the fabric of the customer right and ultimately become yeah. a partner but do so in a way that isn't really resource intensive i think that's where many people fail and done this in the past they built services businesses right where they come in and, and some of the consultancies get teased for this they build their tech and whoever implement the implementation fee of yeah exactly $200,000 so it really that they're building services businesses and maybe they yeah. build past at the end but there's a huge lift and so when you think about trying to grow a business 50 100 200% it's really hard to do that right you just can't do it at scale yeah. and so that i think is the variable that needs to be fixed and again i think you guys are on the forefront of this can you not only build something so robust that it gets you the granularity of insights ultimately and is capable across a really broad array of sectors right and provenly so but then do that integration in a light way whether it's api connection whether it's something yeah. that just is light in that way you truly don't have that giant friction point which then exists in customer onboarding you have rapid customer onboarding I- ideally in your case yeah. it built solutions anyway that feel easy to use and intuitive so yeah. you can train somebody for 2 weeks and then you have an advantage right and if you can go do that geographically in a diversified way if you can go do that sector diversity and build out that fabric position it's really difficult to uproot you right at the end of the day it becomes very difficult to pull that business out of where it is um and that ultimately you have a sustained advantage for quite some time knowing that you have to continue to innovate because i agree with you as i look at some of the data sets that are exclusive today as the number of parties that increase it want that data set and they realize how much more they can charge for it we're going to see a, a democratization yeah. of you know, essentially all yeah. data right? and there always be a couple data points that are exclusive yeah. for a while but it's not sustainable at least for long uh and so to me i guess it's that platform that ends up with the fabric and then most importantly generates really significant value add beyond just being a data consolidator right and that sometimes insights it sometimes something else but we but it seems to me that whatever that answer is or it's more of a smart hub than anything else and i don't know if we have a great indicator of what that is i don't think it's a cdp by definition i don't think it's an entity graph by definition i think it's something else that we're we're ultimately evolving into to fill that hole yeah that's that's um that's a uh, not even a million dollar that's a that's yeah. a, exactly. a few billion dollars worth of the question um the way the way we think about it it's it's very difficult to answer you can only hypothesize and, and you know build a strong point of view over a period of time and then just execute on that and then 
uh, be flexible enough to be able to maneuver if you know what you bet on hasn't really gone down as planned. Um, but uh, you know, we, we say you, you're right in that um, that we are talking to uh, organizations. They are they are now uh, the, the conversation. You know, two years, three years back was when cloud had started. You know, proliferating like crazy uh, with you know, obviously Microsoft and AWS taking charge and Google joining the fray. Um, it was always, let me do it one 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 layer at a time. I'll, I'll figure out my cloud and run. I'm then going to figure out what my data strategy should be and, and how do I go about it? What are the vendors I get? What should be the identity graph? What should it look like? Uh, and by the way, this is not execution. It's just, it's still, it's still, it's still, you know, part of the roadmap of three year, five year plan. Yeah. And then I think about what are the uh, products or, or the presentation layer on top or what are the insights that I want to derive? How do I want to use this data? And, yeah. so, so, and so it was always this, I do one thing first, right? like give me six months, 12 months. I'll do this. I'll do, I'll get Azure. I'll get AWS, GCP. Then I go to the next project and that happens in 2019. And then the next one happens in 2021. Yeah. I think increasingly organizations are realizing, one, obviously the setting that we have today, they're forced to think uh, uh, in a very different manner. They don't have time. They're pressed for time and, and even in some cases budgets. Um, and, and secondly, increasingly it's becoming a conversation of, hey, let's not look. These are not completely disconnected projects. Yeah. One will have an impact on the other. And so now it's becoming a conversation of, hey, not just the infra, but the infra has to be that decision has to come from my thinking and planning on what what that data lake looks like. What is my identity uh, graph strategy? How do I get a 360 degree of consumer? What kind of data sets do I want to invest in? What kind of use cases do I want to drive? Is it personalization? Is it is it better marketing messaging? Is it to be able to do site selection better? Capex investment decisions? You know, generating alk. What is it that I want to do with this? And I need to think top, uh, you know, bottoms up before I take that first decision. And I think that's a very, very significant change. We are seeing this, you know, when we talk to the, the usual, uh, you know, cloud uh, companies, we work with some of them fairly closely, and we are seeing that, they are seeing that as well, that they, this 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 has meant that all these various ecosystem players in, in the value chain have to work more closely together. Um, and it's it's actually a good thing because because then... You know, very often what used to happen, we'd come in and then they've already decided a whole bunch of things and they look at the products and say, oh my God, this is, we've not even thought about this. So now I need to go back and rip off half the things that we've invested in over the past 18 months and just redo the whole thing. Or I, I just continue doing things as is, right? So I think that is a big shift in mindset. It's a big change in the decision-making paradigm that is happening, that will continue to happen. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, CDPs, I think are, solving part of that problem but but if you think about it in a more holistic term then there are a few different pieces that you need to solve for right you think about identity you need to think about how do you sit on top of some of these large cloud platforms uh you need to think about how do you make it almost zero implementation can never be zero but it has to be yeah. uh, almost a turnkey solution uh which is where that integration becomes very very critical right with the, yeah. the cloud solution providers as well and then how do you support some of these use cases? If they're not supported by your product, do you have a partner system where you can go and say, hey, you can use our data, but we can integrate it into a, a different visualization layer if you want, if you're not happy with what we have. Right? So there's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done. Uh, but again, it's a point of view. We'll see how uh, how this pans out. Yeah, no, 100%. And I think that the delay has always been on the customer side and less on the technology side, right? There are a handful, of, and this is maybe always the story. And it, you know, I'm not yeah. sure myself, right? And so I know yeah. the theme, right? You have a great tech, you want to go ask them to use it, and you find they only use 10% of what you're really capable of. And I think there's an education step, there's an adoption step. And the reality is that big customers, when they have privacy considerations, when they think about data, when they see some of the scary headlines that haven't affected them and they don't want to come back down, they're slow. And so there's an education step and adoption really kind of that happens. And as we've talked about, my hope is that COVID-19 at least brings it higher priority set to say, maybe we should go talk about this and spend time with the right providers and try to understand what we're doing and go really utilize and adopt those solutions. And that if the platforms continue to evolve while that's happening, there's probably a really interesting opportunity here for the next couple of years. And I think strategic buyers, right? If you think about the flip side of the bank, you know, they're thinking about it as well, right? Strategic buyers want to own assets that can benefit from this. And so they're out in the market hunting as well, trying to find that solution that solves some of these things. So they have the bet in place for when widespread adoption comes. And 
the, the reality is if you go look at all the players in the space, right, and think about revenue scale, for the most part, if you stack on top of each other, that bottom half is pretty darn small, right? And the reason is they're having yep. a hard time going to win customers. And there's a very select number of large businesses that are, that are doing that well. But to me, the, the, the holdback has always been not the tech, although the tech needs to continue to evolve, but can you get somebody to use and adopt and then really take full advantage of the platform? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and make sure that it's not just a product for early adopters, right? Because right. that's where a yeah. lot of the SaaS companies also struggle. You get to a million, two million, five million ERR, and exactly. in some cases, then you struggle to go beyond because, um, because and that's where the false uh, positive comes in, that you think that these are all early, early adopters are great customers, but just a handful of them. Uh, so yeah, I, I, that makes sense. Completely agree. Completely agree. Well, look, this has, been, uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I think we've really enjoyed this. I think folks uh, that are listening to this later will also really enjoy it. And we're very thankful to have you here and, uh, and really enjoyed the show. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Love the chat. And um, hopefully we'll catch up at some point on the 76th floor of the Empire State Building. So I've heard so much about it. Uh, that uh, that sounds like to a that. plan to me. It's one of the key selling points. <laughs> sounds good. Thank you. Andrew. All right. Bye-bye.